we're friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. The person who loves has become God's child and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I trust in God wherever I may be, on the land or on the rolling sea, for come what may, from day to day, my Heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in
Good morning, church. I'm going to pull a Lennox and say try that again. Good morning, church. Oh, you guys do still love me. I love you too. It's good to see you this morning. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, kind and good, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We ask, Lord, that you would reveal to us your love, that you would reveal to us your grace, and that we would fall more in love with you today. This we say in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. One beautiful summer afternoon, a boy invited his father to go outside to play a game of catch. But this was no ordinary game of catch. Actually, it was simpler than a game of catch. It had much simpler rules, and the boy explained them to his father. And the rules were as simple as follows. He said, Dad, my job will be to pitch the ball, and your job is to say, good throw. It did not matter how high the ball went overhead. It did not matter how far offside the ball went. It did not matter how many times it bounced against the ground. The father's job was simple, to always declare his son's throw perfect in his eyes. Isn't that something a loving father does? A loving father makes up for their child's deficiencies. A loving father is strong where their child is weak. A loving father succeeds where their child fails. In other words, a loving father steps into the weakness of the child to make sure the child can endure. And as I look at the simple story today, I cannot help but think of our heavenly father, Yahweh, who steps in for us when we need him the most. He also is a father who makes up for our deficiencies and declares us perfect in his eyes. And all of this he does because Yahweh is love. Over the last few weeks, I've been taking you through a new sermon series called A Journey Through the Heart of God. And in this series, I've been focusing your attention on the passage of Exodus 34, verses 6 through 8. And in that wonderful passage, God reveals his heart to Moses. And let's look there together for just a moment to remind ourselves what God says to Moses. There in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, God says, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So far I've taught you that Yahweh is a God of infinite mercy and God is a God of incredible patience. And as we continue in our journey through the heart of God, we get now to the core of his being. We get to learn that God is love. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask for you please to turn with me in them. Let us go together to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. This also should be in your handout if you prefer to follow that way. But you can also turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. I'll give you a moment to turn there. While you turn there, I'll give you a little snippet of information. It's wonderful to think that in each of the apostles' writings, they focus on a different characteristic of the life with God. Paul, of course, focuses on faith. James focuses on deeds. Peter focuses on hope. But of all the other apostles that wrote, John is the one that focuses the most on God's love. So when we come here to the Gospel of John, and now where we're here now is 1 John, what we see is the love of God radiating like the sun. Say amen if you've gotten the 1 John 4, 7 through 10. Amen. Amen. Please follow along as I read. I will be reading from the ESV. Here the Apostle John begins... Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 
Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and has sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I love looking right there in verse eight at those three marvelous little words. God is love. What does Yahweh mean when he tells us that he is love? When Yahweh tells us that he is love, he does not mean that love is just one of his many wonderful attributes. In fact, when he tells us that he is love, he is telling us something far deeper and far more profound than that. When Yahweh says that he is love, he is saying that at the very core of his being, he is a loving, relational God. In other words, Love is not one attribute of God. Love is the attribute from which all the other attributes flow. God is not both love and justice. God is just because he is love. God is not both loving and kind. He is kind because he is love. Love spills out in every aspect of God. In everything he does, he does toward you in love. By his very nature... God lives in loving communion with others. You know, God didn't create you because he needed you. You know that, right? God created you because he wanted to love you and to be loved by you. But all of us know that even though God created us for such a wonderful purpose to spend eternity in love with him, something broke the communion between us and God, and we call that sin, Sin came and disrupted the eternal communion that you and I are to have with God forever. But even though that happened, God had a choice he had to make. He either could dispense with us in wrath or he could reunite with us in love. And Yahweh chose love And as we see how Yahweh goes about reuniting us with himself, when we see all that he has done, all of us proclaim God is love. See, what I love about Yahweh is he proves he's a God of love. We don't have to take on faith. It's not something that's blind. He shows us as a matter of fact he's love. Look there with me in verse 9. 1 John 4, verse 9, the Apostle John says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. When Yahweh manifested his love for us, it means that he put his love on full display for every single person to see. Yahweh's love for you is not a secret. It is not something you have to have faith in. It is not something you need to believe in despite the evidence. Yahweh's love is something you can see, something you can hear, something you can reach out, touch, and feel in your heart. God has made his love tangible for all of us to experience. You don't need to turn there right now, but this very epistle of 1 John begins with John telling us he himself has seen the love of God. Here the apostle John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have touched concerning the things of eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest among us, this we proclaim to you. God's love is not something that happens in the dark. God's love is something that happens in the open. It is something that can be seen. God proved that he loved you. And do you know how he proved that he loved you? He proved that he loved you by taking the first step to save you. Look with me there in verse 10. Here the apostle says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us. 
He is the one who loved you first. He is the one who took the first step. He is the one who took the initiative to save you. Remember this. When you sinned, God lost something precious to him. God lost his human family. God lost you. And even though your sin could separate you from Yahweh's presence, your sin can never separate you from Yahweh's love. And so God took it upon himself, his own responsibility to come and save the family that he lost. Never forget this. At its heart, the gospel is the story of a relentless God who's done everything in his power to get his family back. He took the first step to save you. God is always the one who is taking the first step to save you. That's why we can say that God loves you with an unfailing love. How many of you have done wrong in your life? How many of you walked in the wrong path before? Right, people are raising their hands. You don't need to raise your hands, but we all can raise our hands there. Every time you go astray, God never fails to come find you. God never fails to come seeking you, and God never fails to call you back home. That is why we can say that God's love for you never fails. He is the one who searches for his children. When Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't go searching for God, did they? They ran away from God, and God went through the garden. He called, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? God is the one that went looking for them. In Luke 15, that beautiful passage on all of God seeking us, he is shown as an old woman who is passionately looking for her lost gold coin. He is shown as a shepherd who goes high and low through barren wastelands seeking his lost sheep. And he's painted as a father whose eyes search the horizon every day waiting for his beloved son to come home. That is is God. He proves that he loves us by coming to find us. Let me ask you, have you ever lost something precious to you? Something so precious that no matter what, you would move the sky and earth itself to find that thing? I have. I was uh, officiating a wedding in the state of Tennessee for a friend of mine, and during a series of circumstances, Michael went missing. Now, parents, you know, there's nothing that would terrify your heart more than your children missing. Now, now to be honest, the older they get, like, it takes a little bit longer for that fear to kick in. Okay, that's true. But about five to ten minutes later, when you still can't find them, and that is what I was feeling, and I scour this entire church, and I ask everybody I could see, have you seen my boy? And none of them knew where he was. And I scoured the whole church. The only place I did not look was the bridal suite where the bride was getting dressed and the bridesmaids. Now, now, if you've ever seen a mama bear angry, that's one thing. You ever see a papa grizzly bear get angry looking for his cubs, that's a whole different story. I went to find my boy and this lady, bless her heart, I'm sure she meant well and was a great woman, I'm sure she was. She saw me come in. She goes, whoa, 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 sir. You can't go in there. That's where the bride is getting ready. And I said, no, no, see, what you don't understand is, is, is I've lost my son, and I need to find him. And then she looks at me, and she goes, well, what you don't understand, sir, is this is reserved for the ladies now. Now, mm, mm, mm. I had to pray to Jesus. <laughs> to keep my religion, because <laughs> there were words I wanted to say, but I knew God would not want me to. And so I said, but man, what you don't understand is I've looked in this entire church for my son, and I can't find him, and I don't care who's behind those doors. I am going to walk in there, and I am going to find my boy, and I don't care if I have to tear this church apart brick by brick. I will not leave until I find my son. And do you know where my son was? In that bridal suite, the guard who blocked me couldn't block a six-year-old who snuck in there behind her. She tried to stop me from finding my son, but nothing 
would stop me from finding someone that's so precious to me. And it's the same with you and God. When God lost you, he didn't just lose a human. He lost a son. He lost a daughter. And he will move earth and heaven so he can come and find a way to bring you back to himself. God proves he is love because he took the first step to save you. But God proves he's love by something else. Not only did he take the first step to save you, but he saved you at great cost to himself. I can assure you for all eternity, even as we study the gospel, you will never come to fully comprehend what it truly cost God to save you and I. When we look there together in verse 10, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In order for us to understand the amazing love of God here, we need to understand the true plight of our sin. Many of us have a very small view of sin. By that, I mean many of us look at sin as just a specific act of rebellion against God. And, and that is true in as far as it goes. But our situation with sin is far more serious than that. Sin is not just something we do. Sin is something we are. Sin is not just an action. Sin is a condition. And this is the point that Jesus gets across to us when he tells us the parable of the tax collector. In Jesus' parable of a tax collector, there's the story of this tax collector who is so full of remorse that he can't even look at heaven. He's too ashamed to look up at God Almighty. He casts his eyes to the ground, and Jesus says that he beats his chest in anguish, and he cries out to the Lord saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Notice what happened. This tax collector did not repent of anything he did. He repented of who he was. Because he understood sin is not just something you do. Sin is something you are. So every single person, you and me included, whether you're irreligious or religious, moral or immoral, godly or ungodly, all of us have inherited a sinful nature, a rebellious nature from Adam that makes us filthy in the eyes of God. First Kings 4, 4, uh, 8, 46, there is no one who does not sin. Psalm 14, 3, there is none who does not do, there's no one who does good, no, not one. Romans 3, 11, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Not a single one of us has any merit to offer Jesus to earn our salvation. Listen to me. The only thing you have to offer God is the very sinful acts that made your salvation necessary to begin with. All our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. If God is to bring you back to himself, then he must find a way to deal with the sinful nature that made you filthy in his eyes. And do you know how he went about doing that? Verse 10, he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. We don't use that word a lot anymore. I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I used propitiate or propitiation in normal conversation. And so many of us have forgotten the depth of what this word means. But the one part I'll point out today is this. Propitiation means satisfying someone's judicial wrath. What God is saying here is that he specifically sent his son 
to this world to absorb his wrath so you don't have to. In other words, when Jesus hung upon the cross, he took all of God's judgment upon himself so your sin would be forgiven and you would be declared pure and perfect in the eyes of God. I love how scholar John Stott describes our salvation. You have this in your handout if you want to follow along. John Stott says, quote, for the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. We're gonna talk more about this in our next sermon series about the Trinity. But the Trinity is the thing that makes salvation possible. Because what happened on the cross is God the Father poured his wrath out upon God the Son. He destroyed a part of himself so that you could live with him forever. The Trinity is forever changed because Jesus died for you on the cross. We will never understand the true cost of salvation. Think of it. Just try to ponder it. Before there was anything, there was the triune God living in perfect harmony, perfect fellowship, perfect love, perfect community. And then we came along and we sinned and the trying God looked into himself and said the only way I can bring them back is by breaking the perfect harmony I've always had with myself. See, we often look at it as God killing his son and that's a hard thing to look at because we're trying to wrap our minds around what is happening. But when you understand the triune God, you understand that God destroyed an aspect of himself so that you would live for him forever. And when I realize that God gave up that part of him to be with me, how could I ever deny that God is love? When Jesus hung on that cross, he bore all the horrible weight of your sin. Every sin, every act of rebellion, every lustful thought, everything of iniquity was placed upon his shoulders. And as God the Father, whose eyes are too pure and righteous to even look upon sin, he looked down on his boy, the very boy he once said, with you I am well pleased. He now looks at his boy, he sees your sin, he turns away from his son in disgust, and he pours his wrath out on his son. And as God the Son feels this wrath come upon him, he cries out from his soul, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, as the wrath of God is poured out, his entire wrath is exhausted in the eyes of heaven. It was not deflected, it was not moved, this is not like an engineer going to a stream, putting stones there to divert the waters this direction. No, 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 no. Jesus literally absorbed the entire wrath of God against a whole sinful universe into himself and exhausted his wrath completely. He has served your sentence. The sin you committed years ago is forgiven the sin you're committing now is forgiven. The sins that you will even commit in the future, as long as you hold on to Jesus, they are forgiven in the eyes of God because he has already served your sentence complete and in full. This is why Isaiah, I imagine with tears in his eyes, I can't prove it, but I assume it. This is why he said, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted, 
For he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Do you feel peace between you and God? Frank prayed powerfully earlier that we are forgiven by him and declared perfect. The, I don't have this in the sermon, so I'll just throw it out there, but we know later on in 1 John 4 that it says that perfect love casts out all fear because fear has to do with judgment. In other words, when you realize the perfect love of God, and all that he has done to save you, you don't fear judgment anymore. In fact, you look forward to heaven because you know when your name is called up yonder, it's gonna be Jesus' merits in place of your own and you will spend eternity with Jesus in paradise. Jesus has absorbed the wrath of God. Your sin is not accounted to you anymore. Every one of you is free. Every one of you is forgiven. Every one of you is pardoned. And you know what? God is going to be just as happy to have you in heaven as you are to be there. Because that's the day he gets his family back. We see King Hezekiah say to God, you have put all my sins behind your back. God's not dwelling on your sins. He's not focused on your sins. They are behind his back. He can't see them. There's an old saying, out of sight, out of mind. Right? God is not looking at your sins. He's not trying to keep you out of heaven. He's trying to get you into heaven. And Micah goes on and says in Micah 7, 9, that God, he will hurl. I love that word. He will hurl all of our iniquities in the depth of the sea. He doesn't merely go over and just let your, your sin slip off the ship, <laughs> right? He doesn't go by and merely just, you know, toss it overboard. He hurls it as far away from himself as he possibly can. And then as your sea metaphorically sinks down into the depths of the ocean and rests there on the ocean bed, forever forgotten and never to be recovered again. This, my friends, is the beauty of, of our salvation and Jesus serving as the propitiation of our sin. Our sin is not accounted to us. It costs God something very great to make you be forgiven. And when you realize he took that step and that step cost him his life, then you know God is love. Never forget that there's nothing you can do that God cannot forgive. I love this little comic I came across the other day I want to share with you. A blizzard had come through and I'm guessing it canceled school. I don't know these comics don't give a bunch of history. I kind of make them up in order to fit the sermon sometimes. But the boys go outside to play in this beautiful snow. And one of the boys is just trouncing along, having a great time. But one of the other sons gets a little angry. He goes, he knocks on the door of his house, and he says to Mommy, Mommy, will you tell Billy to stop using up all the snow? <laughs> Do you see how much snow is there? I mean, look at that. As far as the eye can see, and this is only a corner. We don't even know how much snow is at the front of our house. This boy looked at the snow as if it was a, limit, a limited resource. And he was afraid his brother would use it all up. But look at it all. There is no way those two boys could use up all the snow. And you know what? The grace of God is just like that. The grace of God is not a limited resource. And there is nothing you can do to use it all up. As I heard one, one professor say, I forget which one, but I want to give credit to where it's due to somebody that wasn't me. But they said, never think that God can't forgive you 
if he can bear the sins of the entire world, then certainly he can hold your own private collection. Whatever you're going through, God's already forgiven. Whatever mistake you've made, God's already pardoned. He did that by bringing a great cost on himself so that you might live with him forever. As Professor Roy Gaines says, the ability of the cross to save you is just as powerful today as the day when Jesus died. The atonement has not lost one bit of its efficacy. The power of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross flows unabated from Calvary to you nearly 2,000 years later. All you must do is look upon the cross and believe in you will be saved. God is love. He has proven to you that he loves you beyond anything you can possibly imagine. He has proven this to you by taking the first step to find you even when you were not trying to find him. And he proved this to you by going to find you even at great cost to himself. As he said right before he went to the cross, Jesus says these words to his disciples. Greater love has no one than this than that he would lay down his life for his friend. And guess what? You are God's friend. And God laid his life down with you. Before you lies a decision today, will you accept that great gift of God's salvation? Will you accept the forgiveness he is offering you? God has made it as absolutely easy as possible in order for you to be saved. Think of it this way, when he had Noah build the ark, God didn't force anyone on the ark, but he didn't force anyone off either. God, in a very real way, if you were a judge, he has placed the gavel in your hand and you decide for yourself right now whether or not you will go to heaven. And all you need to do is tap that gavel down and say, I choose Jesus. And when you do, your record is wiped clean and you are declared perfect in his eyes. God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And I hope that you accept that gift of salvation so that when I get to heaven, I'm going to see you there. And for all eternity, we are going to learn just how loving our Yahweh truly is. Please join us standing as we close this beautiful service with higher ground.
and to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has called the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven. your heads as I pray a prayer of blessing upon you. Heavenly Father, be with this shepherd as I now intercede for my sheep. I pray simply that you would warm their hearts with your love, that their souls would be moved by your goodness in a way they have never been moved before, and that you would draw them to yourself. Proclaim your love to them. Declare your forgiveness over them. And may they walk in peace, knowing that they are in harmony with their God. Give them, please, a beautiful Sabbath. A day with you, a day with friends and family, that they would walk away today and say, surely this was a blessed day for the Lord was in it. I ask you this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.